today is going to be a very fun discussion. I'm joined by a fellow radio broadcaster, someone who was at CBC, and uh, he is someone who has been a chronicler of some very interesting thinkers that I think have their finger on the pulse of what is happening in our times, how strange they are. We have with, uh, with us David Cayley. How are you, sir? Well, thank you, David. Nice to talk to you again. Yeah. It's great to see you on video this time. We did yeah, a radio absolutely. conversation last time. That's right. And uh, you've got a new publication out. I'm looking at your website, davidcayley.com, and you've got a new one. Ivan Illich, An Intellectual Journey, which is just out. Was it last year you published this? Yeah, it came out in, in early last year. Okay, well, very good. Now, I don't remember when did we talk. I think it was before the book came out, right? I think it would have been before the book yeah. came out, yeah. It was right so, during the beginning of the COVID stuff, I believe. I, I was kind of, so, yeah. I was, I was I like, so. I want to get your opinion on this since you've talked yeah. to uh, yeah. these folks. Yeah. So having... Published, why did you want to publish this book now? What was the purpose of the timing here? Was it just something you had on your to-do list, or how did it happen? Well, I don't know if I should introduce the subject of the book before answering. Sure. Not, yeah. not everyone knows who Ivan Illich was, yeah, sure. but he was a, a Catholic priest and um, intellectual, uh, the author of many books, uh, from 1970 through 2002 when he died and my primary teacher um, but it happened that he he was not a a writer who wrote everything you know there are some writers who systematically expound their ideas he wasn't really like that he wrote two occasions and he wrote quite sparingly to those occasions so it happened that he hadn't really ever exposed what I thought was the heart of his thinking, which was his idea that the whole pattern of Western civilization is formed on the Catholic Church, uh, on the Christian Church. There was only one up till the split with the East and then only two up to, to the time of the Reformation. And he so we had done a book together that was initially a set of radio interviews published only after he died, which was in 2002. The book came out in 2005. It was called The Rivers North of the Future. I have a copy of that, yes. Okay, Ivan Illich on um, Gospel Church and Society. That was the name of the radio series. Um, and in that set of interviews, he really sketches something. He sketches it very beautifully, very eloquently, very clearly, but it is still a sketch. He called it a research hypothesis. There was much more to be said about it, and he wasn't going to say it. Uh, so it felt to me in a certain way to say it, since he had disclosed what he thought to me. So as soon as I retired from the CBC in 2012, I, uh, I set to work on this big book, and I, I have to admit it, it's a very big book, it's, it's quite long, um, in which I try and explore his life and thought. It's not at all a biography, um, but it is an attempt to tell how he lived, and it is an attempt to tell how he thought and, and to try and bring it all together. Um, so that's Ivan Illich, an intellectual journey. So, and it kind of is it the behind the scenes of the rivers, the the river running north of the future, or well, it isn't behind the scenes. I don't think. Um, <clears throat> is it a context, or how? It's how do a you... kind of it's a kind of a thinking with, I would say. Okay. Okay. It's 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 the it's the continuation of a conversation. Um, and, and a thinking with Illich that went on during the time I knew him well, which was the last 20 years or so of his life. And you call, so, your, you were a student of his, right? Well, I met him as a broadcaster. Uh, so I was probably too old to formally be a student. <laughs> but yes, I learned a, an immense amount from him. 
and was happy to call him a friend uh, later, but uh, but certainly was also always it, someone who learned from him. And what were you learning? What were you most interested in? His the, the theology or how his 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 well, thesis about how he, we're a Christ haunted society, right? Well, I mean, yes, but I could go back to 1969 when I first encountered his writings. I had been for two years in the Canadian organization, which is roughly similar to the American Peace Corps, had lived um, in uh, northern Borneo and was quite puzzled by this whole enterprise of international development, as it was then called, which had young people like me volunteering and young Americans going to Peru or Kenya. And um, it was Illich who made most sense of it to me. Um, and, and that continued through books like Deschooling Society, Medical Nemesis, Tools for Conviviality, all those books I, I formed my worldview uh, in part on those books. And so he was always the one who made most sense to me. But when I finally got to spend more time with him and to do this radio series for the CBC in 1988, and I had gone down to see him, he was then teaching at the Pennsylvania State University in State College, Pennsylvania. And I had prepared myself diligently. I had read everything that he wrote and he absolutely startled me on the last day of a very long interview. It had gone on for 12 days, I think. Once or twice a day, we would sit down and, and record. Um, he said um, th in this final day, uh, the whole history of the West can be summed up in the old adage, corruptio optimi pessima, the corruption of the best is the worst. And I thought, wait a minute, the whole history of Western civilization is summed up here. Why hadn't I heard about this in any of your written works? Mm -hmm. So yes, that, that became a subject that I, if you would like studied with him, right? What, what does this mean? What does it mean to say that the Western civilization and now the worldwide civilization that traces itself to European modernity is, 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 is a kind of inside out or upside down gospel? Uh, it's, it's a huge thought, which I could barely think at all at first. And I, so I pressed him, well, when are you going to? <laughs> explain this to me <laughs> and he was old and ill and had many other demands on his time so and I think was also cautious about something an idea which for a Christian as he was uh, is quite explosive right it's 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 it stands very close to certain kinds of fundamentalisms right I mean, it isn't the first time the word antichrist has ever been mentioned in history, right? I mean, that was the Protestants called the Pope, the Antichrist, and so on. And so this, this idea that, that um, had that also that controversial, explosive character, which may also have created reticence. Whatever it was, it wasn't till the later 90s that I finally said, look, I, I, don't, I don't think... <laughs> ever going to write this book so what about if we do it again i'll come with my microphones and we'll create another radio series and you can you know put it on me in effect and he agreed uh, so that was the beginning of the the rivers north of the future which then led me to try and create this other book and i still think i'm only at the beginning with trying to understand what this means now, was that your intent to do those kind of big idea explorations when you did radio? I don't think so, right? When you first started radio. Well, it all happened one step at a time, David. It all happened 
I mean, were you always a dreamer and think big think, uh, you know, inquisitive thinker about the way the world is and existential questions about why is this the way it is? And were you always kind of off kiltered and looking at the world from a different perspective? <laughs> Because you have to be to be interested in this, right? <laughs> you probably you probably know the answer to that. Yes, I dare say that's true, but but I had no plan. I mean, whoever has a plan, uh, it 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 was just that the CBC in the early seventies presented itself as as the way to, um, in effect, finance a continuing education. Right, that I could make programs about things that i was interested in and wanted that's kind of what about. i'm doing here on this yeah. podcast <laughs> yeah i mean you're it's a yeah. if you can do it you're pretty lucky right yeah it's and and i found more or less that i could do it and and so and then it it grew through many years after 1980 at, at a show called ideas which was kind of made for me anyway i, I mean i don't wasn't literally made for me, but it suited me. And so I began to develop longer form programming uh, and really by the end had pretty much abandoned documentary as a kind of self-defeating form, right? It, it, I had been struck from the beginning. You could create a one hour program with let's say five or six or seven or eight, whatever it was, thinkers in it. And people would often be very impressed afterwards, but not be able to remember anything they'd heard. That often struck me, you know, I love that show you did last night. Well, what did you like about it? Well, I especially like the part where, uh, you know, the, the guy said this about that, you know? <laughs> So I, I, and I, it came to a, a head after a series called The Politics of Information, which had, I was able to get a lot of very good interviews. Uh, Noam Chomsky, Edward Said, a number of other eminent media theorists. And I thought afterwards, well, you know, I mean, I've, I've cut them up in generous portions, you know, but in the end, each one would be just as interesting by itself and might be more memorable in the sense that you're not then shoehorning every thinker into some prescribed frame, if you like. So that I began to think that things would be more better understood and perhaps even more memorable if you got to just stay with Chomsky, let's say. Mm -hmm or anybody else. I mean, why does he think what this, this answer leads to a further question, right? Well, let's unpack that. Let, let's unpack, you know, let's, let's keep digging. Let's go into this and let's find out who you are. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that, that developed into a kind of form of programming, which I, and a lot of those old series are on my website now, where you're really only listening to one or a handful of people. And you're, um, for my audience, they may know that I reference, I often tell people who ask me, because this podcast is called Things Hidden, which is a reference to uh, Rene Girard's work, Things yes. Hidden Since the Foundation of the World, which is a reference to Jesus's work. <laughs> Yes, the gospel. So it's all a reference. It's all just constant signs. But um, uh, I often recommend when someone says, "Well, I don't know where to start with Rene Girard," I tell them to read "I See Satan Fall Like Lightning," and then I also tell them, "But while you're waiting for that book to arrive in the mail, start with the CBC radio series that David Cayley did." Oh, that's very with nice. Rene Thank Girard. You. Thank you. Because it's it's very concise and it's a great introduction it's five parts one hour each right and how how many hours did you guys actually talk to get to that distillation of five well i couldn't tell you but it was three days i remember it was three days and we worked um morning and afternoon punctuated by an excellent lunch provided by martha Girard, <laughs> who was as hospitable as renee was so i was made very welcome in their home in uh, in Palo Alto, or on the Stanford campus, 
um, yeah, those were very wonderful days. How did you, uh, when did you get interested in Gerard's work? Well, there's two roots to it. Uh, Illich and people around Illich uh, were very taken up with Shikhar with just the early work. So mimetic desire, particularly deceit desire in the novel, as it was called in English. So Illich was very familiar with Gerard's work? Um, well, he never, I don't know what he thought about the whole corpus, but he was very interested in triangular desire, mimetic desire, the whole, as um, he himself at the time he encountered that book was was working on scarcity and, and rethinking economics. And so he, he found Girard, and particularly a, a book done by two Girardians, Jean-Pierre Dupuy and Pierre Dumouchel, who did a book that I think has never been fully translated in English called L'Enfer des Choses, The Hell of Things. Dumouchel's essay, The Ambivalence of Scarcity, has been translated, but the whole book is not available in English. But that was how it was conveyed to the Illich circle. So there was great interest there. And then the other route was that um, I became connected to a Norwegian criminologist by the name of Nils Christie, who, um, and I did a series of broadcasts with him in the early 90s called Crime Control as Industry. Nils had been one of a whole school of European criminologists who were part of, who recommended this radical dis decrease in imprisonment that occurred in, in Europe and in the United States and Canada too after the Second World War. So this sort of great U-turn this great U-shaped mm -hmm. thing where, where prison rates go down and down and down and down. And then suddenly in the 80s, they, they just turn back up dramatically. Right? Um, and, you know, you can trace it to the American presidential election partly of 1988, but it's much bigger than that. And... So Nils was forming these alarming ideas about the ways in which the crime control complex fits into the emergent social formation, whatever you call it, post late capitalism, post modernism, you know, people have different yeah. names for it, but a, clearly a new social formation with the neoliberalism was emerging sort of post Reagan, post Thatcher and the crime control complex fit it like a glove right um as a way of making convenient enemies as a, a way of providing employment even you could say according to Illich's lingo as a form of shadow work that something useful the prisoners could do would be <laughs> would be to go to prison and provide work and an object lesson for all the other un so far unimprisoned workers um so Nils had worked all that out in this book called crime control is industry and through him then we became friends and i was drawn into this whole as he conceived it political emergency i mean he that's the point he really wanted to convey was this is not just something that's happening over here you don't just keep as many prisoners as the united states was keeping or as the, the ex the former Soviet republics were keeping. Um, and it was going up everywhere, but they were the leaders. You don't keep that many prisoners and think that it won't change your society. It will change your society profoundly. So he wanted to get that across. He enlisted me to help in a certain way. And to, so I ended up doing a lot more programs than I ever expected on the subject of criminology and crime control. And in the course of that, I met many people who were reading Shikhar, right? And who, for whom the, the theory of the scapegoat, and it was a very important, provided a very important insight 
into why this could be happening. That's how so, I got it. That's how I got interested in Gerard as kind of the criminal justice element. Too. Was it? Yeah. yeah. And so that's that's why I eventually ended up reading Gerard and and you know was pretty much blown away and and uh, and then was lucky enough to get to go and hang out with him. Now was Gerard familiar with Illich's work and what did he think of that? Did you talk to him? Well, we did. And and they, when did you interview Gerard, by the way? Sorry, just trying to that get would have, time. I think that was in two, I'm guessing 2001. So you were, you were two, well versed. 2000, 2000, so, you were, I think. so you were well uh, catechized in Illich's work. And when you go into Gerard's interview, you're very familiar with that as your background, right? Yes. And, and Gerard knew Illich and, and approved of his work. I think Illich although he never really explained it, had a reservation uh, which might have related to Girard's having created a, a system of thought. Um, it may have seemed too, too, uh, too total to Ivan. I never really found out. But when they met together, because I, I was... I was very taken with the Girards, and I was also at that time. Ivan was living temporarily in Oakland, um, and so I said, "Well, can, will you, let's go and have lunch with the Girards." And he said, "Yes." So we went. We went down and had a very pleasant lunch, but but no real conversation ever developed between the two. No, sadly. Because I, I think the two, the, the interesting thing, see, I'm not as familiar with Illich's work, but what, from what I've learned from you and, and cursory reading of some of his, uh, and his interviews and some of the books that I've picked up from him, is that there's a lot of overlap in that idea of we live in this, what Gerard's super Christianity idea is very much, I mean, unless I'm not seeing it right, it seems very uh, congruent with what Illich is saying about that you know the institutions of the west are a kind of perverse coercive mutation of the gospel i mean that's almost exactly what gerard's discovering with his work too i think you're absolutely right um and but it's almost as if the emphasis falls in opposite places with the two of them right so illich is a a negative thinker. Uh, uh, he's he once said to a friend that his business was proscription, not prescription, and he pretty much stuck to that. Like there, you're not going to find any plan. Uh, and so, what not to do, in other words. Um, and although Crené is also a critical thinker. There, there is very much an emphasis also on the, the positive legacy, if you like. It's just kind of a crude way of speaking mm -hmm. of the gospel, right? That, that the, 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 a more positive account of science, of secularization uh, as demystification or demythification. Um, so there's the different emphases, but if you look, yes, I think what you just said is, is really, really spot on. So um, I think Girard's idea that as people forsake or believe they have forsaken Christianity, they very, are very apt to turn into what he called super Christians, couldn't be more obvious for those who have eyes to see it today is very similar to Ivan yeah, saying that our institutions are are inversions or degenerations or however you would want to specify of Christian originals yeah, yeah so yes, always and I think they they are they both there's an essay that's on my website that I did for a, a a uh, handbook of uh, sort of one of these handbooks for uh, for people studying Girard, which compares their thinking on Antichrist 
and it, I, I think it comes out very similar. Yeah. So there's multiple paths up to the same conclusive, uh, you know, perhaps truth about where we're at today. That you yes. Can... Yeah, there really is. So, you know, Illich did not have a positive, he didn't see the positive, he didn't see the paradox of what, what Gerard saw with Christianity bringing out um, the scientific revolution and, and bringing out the idea of having due process in the courts and having a fair trial and a jury trial. And instead of just, you know, going to lynch mobs and things like that, like he didn't see the ambivalence of it all. Like there's positive and good in these things. I think he did see it. I think he absolutely did see it. He just chose to emphasize the shadow. Why? As a, because that's what you have to see if you're going to become free of it. Right? He, he, he didn't. That was just what he chose. That was the path he chose. Yeah. And that was, I think his, his gifts lay in that direction. But that also was the way he chose to live. How would um, one be free of it uh, from the, the the corruption of Christianity in our institutions? I mean, what was his? Did he have a prescription, or I mean, you say he didn't, but did he have an answer for how to get out of the the wrong way of doing Christianity that well, we're doing? Well, I, I think we could talk all day about that, but um, he, from the very beginning, he was a priest. So he he was ordained in 1951 in Rome and um, was a, a brilliant man and uh, clearly uh, apt for a career as the prince of the church and and you know lots of people including the future Pope Paul VI had their eye on him and thought he should stay in Rome and go to the College of Nobles and you know become a prince of the church future Pope perhaps but he wanted to get away from Rome. So he, he, went, he went without knowing what he was doing to New York and ended up becoming fascinated with the Puerto Rican migration, which was then in full spate. And the, the Puerto Ricans were being less badly treated by the Irish and the Italians who then dominated the New York church as they had been badly treated in their turn, right? These, these um, Southern Spanish-speaking people were, were quite anomalous in the New York church. And Ivan became fascinated with them and also very interested in their quite different form of Christianity. Right? And so he ended up for years involved with the Puerto Ricans and ended, was vice rector of the university in Puerto Rico for four years and, and lived there. But, but um, anyway, he, as a priest, he always made a very firm distinction between what he called the church as she and the church as it. So the church is a worldly object, an object of sociological study, uh, not different than any other institution in that respect, but the church is also, uh, as he says, a divine bud that will flower in eternity. Their church is the pearl in the net. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that can only be kept in mind. It's, it can never become uh, a permanently effective distinction right you can't prevent the church from being a worldly institution it is a worldly institution but you can know the difference right so to give a dramatic example when he went to puerto rico he he, he was vice rector of the university the catholic university at ponce well he regarded that as a political position probably quite properly and then said it would it would be no exercise of his priesthood as long as he was in a political position, but he got, he found a little remote fishing community. And there he would go and celebrate mass with a bunch of fishermen who had maybe no idea that there was a university and certainly no idea that he was anything special because he was connected to it. 
So he always made that that distinction, and I think he tried to manifest it throughout his life. And it was it's interesting that when he started the place that became very well known in in Cuernavaca, the Center for Intercultural uh, Documentation, uh, from sixty one on to seventy six. Um, he, he the meetings he convened and so on became the seat of liberation theology right which is pretty well known but ivan always stood back from it because he he would he wouldn't countenance any politicization of the gospel he felt you always had to see the difference right so um so I think that's the only answer one really can give uh, is to know the difference. Where did, he, where did he think it went wrong at the very beginning in terms of the church going off the wrong path and going into... He well, talks he, about the Good he, Samaritan as his framing of things, right? This, this yes. You, I mean, you've, you've read The Rivers North of the Future. So he has a he has a story um, that in the early church, the role of prophets, and there are prophets referred to in the New Testament, was precisely to identify this tendency, which the New Testament also calls antichrist or false Christs. Um, and so it's, it's his conceit. I don't know whether New Testament scholarship would really back him up on this, that there was a knowledge at the beginning that the incarnation, insofar as it manifested itself in the world, would manifest a shadow, as all worldly things do. Mm. And that, that, that uh, with the possibility of loving in a new way of, of loving God in the person of one another, which was in a, a sentence, how he understood the gospel also would come the shadow, which is the possibility that this would be become a basis of power, right? It would become, that it would found a power. It did found the power, <laughs> the church. And, and it, so the claim that this greatest of all knowledge, that this freedom to love and to find God in one another could become a source of a new kind of power, new kind of worldly power, which would claim to administer, guarantee, preserve, etc all necessary not all but preserving certainly was a necessary function right it, he never was a i mean he was often misunderstood right because if you if you if you see the shadow in the institution you must therefore be a romantic or you believe that there could be a world without institutions or something equally harebrained which was never his view but he did always see the shadow in the institution, and he saw it as a unique shadow insofar as the incarnation was unique and what was institutionalized was unique. So it wasn't just any institution subject to the automatic process of corruption to which any institution would be subject, but it was this particular institution subject to this particular process of corruption. How would how would the knowledge of of being able to love each other freely and see God in one another give an institution power? Well, and there you would have to study the history of the Roman Church. Yeah, uh, it, it isn't because I can see I see I'm I'm coming from the Girardian perspective, and I look at that and I say, well, he's saying. From Gerard's angle, it's the revelation of how scapegoating works that slowly starts to uh, erode superstitious practices of violence, which allows you to
to turn to other ex other explanations for phenomena, which yeah. allows you to develop science. So I can track the the taxon, you know, I can track the evolutionary trajectory of what's going on there in his theory. But what is it about uh, the gospel from Illich's perspective that allowed people to to gain power and use it in a way that was so unique to make the world we have today? Well, I, I mean, I think that. I don't think he ever discusses the question in the form you've just asked it, but I would say that a lot of that is historical accident, right? The church was a cohesive institution in a, de in a decaying empire, right? It, it was a, a, an, as a, a, an ascending or buoyant institution with um it had charisma and energy it, yes it had it, exactly and so you know the bishops become magistrates under under constantine and and they are exercising and the church becomes a welfare organization in a decaying empire because it, it's able to be a welfare organization mm -hmm. now once you get it, it becomes a whole other story when you get to the high middle ages right and and uh, the the claim that you, that you get, let's say, in, in uh, Pope Gregory the Seventh, the dictate his famous dictate of the Pope, promulgated in ten seventy seven, in which he makes an, an extraordinary claim uh, for the the power and centrality of the papacy. Right. So I mean, it, it's certainly based on having the truth. Right? Uh, it's the Pope is the one whose feet are to be kissed by all emperors, which <laughs> didn't go down that well with the emperors and led to two centuries of, you know, this so-called investiture controversy about who could create bishops. But the, the, the church made amongst other things, a, a radical bid for ascendancy and, and, and centrality and power. But uh, I, it certainly was related to the claim to know the truth and to the claim of apostolic succession, that, that this was a continuous tradition that traced its, mm -hmm. uh, in which Jesus' hand was still felt. So the way I understand the gospel from a, a mimetic theory perspective, it's almost like the gospel is a technology that is a nuclear technology that can be used for great good or great evil if you exploit, you know, the advantage that it gives you in the playing field of world affairs, so to speak. And so, you know, it's like, it's like a lens that allows you to see things, you know, like uh, goggles that allow you to see thermo, you know, heat imprints at night and stuff. It gives you an advantage that you see used for good and ill in history. And I wonder if that's kind of a similar thing that Illich is, is intuitively Seeing I think it gospel. probably is. Uh, I I was, um, I, I'm a great admirer of a British sociologist of religion, also uh, a priest, uh, David Martin, who died recently. Um, but in a book called The Breakdown of the Image, um, a, a very, you know, David was a sociologist of religion, but this is a very poetical book that he wrote. And when I met him, he was very gratified that it was the one I admired. But he he uses the same image you just did of of the splitting of the atom, right? Yeah. And and I think I mean it's God that's broken and distributed on the cross, right? The atom is that's broken is God. Yeah. Uh, so yes, an immense an immense power is set loose by, you could say, the cracking of the code. I mean, that's 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 what Oppenheimer and his friends did, and and um, that's in a certain way what's what's done uh, at the crucifixion. I think that um, Gerard is tries to caution us to be more.
kinder to periods of history where we see brutality and violence to let us remind ourselves that uh, humanity is slow to wake up from the scapegoat violence of its origins. And so it's going to happen in fits and starts. And we have to be very careful not to, to have that kind of mindset that he corrected from his earlier works where he's like, no, all of history is sacrificial and the gospels have a sacrificial component to it. It's a different kind of sacrifice. And we can't stand on top of history and look down our noses on other periods of history and say, oh, you guys didn't understand the gospel. It's like, no, this is a process that we're still in ourselves. And, um, and it's, it's a process of kind of uh, demystification that we're still undergoing. And so he tried to caution people to be not so critical of the institutions of, of church uh, corruption in the past. You could say it's wrong, but say it's wrong in context and in humility. Did, did Ivan Illich have a perspective similar to that? Like we have to be careful not to condemn the church's history, uh, even though, you know, it's obviously uh, the source of this corruption of Christianity in some sense. Well, he regarded it as the will of God. I, I know that. That it would he be said, corrupt? He, he said so, yeah. yeah. I mean, that this, he, he took it for granted as a man of faith that what occurs is the will of God, finally. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so... Um, I think it, it cost him some sleepless nights to think that thought. Um, and, but he, he was in the end, a, a man of, of, of simple, uh, of simple faith. Um, so I can remember, this is an anecdote I've, I've told in the book, but uh, we were sitting one night in a, open air kitchen in Cuernavaca talking he and another friend and I and and he I said you know that I had always regarded the passage in which the keys of the kingdom are given to Peter as as an interpolation by the church in the gospel and he said yes I was often exposed to that idea as a young man but it to me, it's, I, it's a matter of, of faith to take that statement uh, as read. That, 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 and, and then he went on to say that um, Jesus in his divine mind would, would have foreseen everything down to our sitting together that summer night. Um, and that there, there would be no possible way for us to understand that, right? He called that the darkness of God. Um, and I, I always remembered that, particularly speaking about the darkness of God, not, not using darkness in the sense of the, <laughs> the condition under which we cannot see, yeah. not, not, not darkness in the in any other sense. Right. So when you look at, you know, you used to talk about de-schooling society and medical nemesis, and we live in these things, these controversies. Um, I think about what's going on right now with people wanting in America to flee government schoolings uh, models and go to things like unschooling. And, right. uh, you know, I, I look at, uh, you know, of course, what happened with this pandemic and the lockdowns, you know, we'll, you know, in Australia, how they wouldn't even let them out for recess in their backyard pretty much for 30 minutes a day or something. And um, this looks right out of the, you know, the nightmares of, of Illich's work in some sense, a kind of prof prophetic fulfillment of weird things he saw going. And uh, I also think Gerard had a lot of prophetic insights into where we're at today. I, I often mention it seems like, uh, Rene Girard passed away and then God said, Hey, yeah, you can write the script for the next few years of the world events to give people clues, to speed up their knowledge about what I'm trying to do here. 
<laughs> it's a plausible story, David. <laughs> Uh, you know, and and here we are today, like as we're speaking there, you know, the governor of my state, Florida, said, you know, I, we're not really going to push this uh, mRNA product on six month old babies. We think if you want to do that, that's on you. We're not going to push that. Right. And they're treating that like grand heresy. You know, oh, God forbid a governing official would say, don't put <laughs> it's like we've all lost our minds. Collect. You can't even think straight to be to say wait a second, just a few years ago, we would say be cautious about something that doesn't have any long-term studies of the effect and we're putting this into six month old babies and they don't have hard cases of this disease in the first place. So why in the world is this a controversial thing to push back about? You know, it's like we've lost our minds collectively over this public health scientism. So, I mean, I guess uh, trying to unpack some lessons learned from you're encountering with Gerard and Illich in this time that's where I'm headed here. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, I, I couldn't, I, I'm, I'm amazed. I mean, the, what you just said would be a pretty good epitome of what amazes me, right? Yeah. That, that it would become a matter of dogma and social allegiance um, to, to give, a population not at risk, a vaccine which, by definition, you can't know the long-term effects, particularly yeah. on very young ones. Um, it, I don't. I can. I can barely make sense of it, and yet I'm. I can. I can stand at my door and meet. You know, within an hour, I'll have met ten neighbors who regard that as obviously rational right absolutely necessary so yeah it's a it is a very it's a hard thing to understand i think um when you take into account the censorship which is demonstrable right so i can show you for example um that a, a man who was, who I know, who, who was the medical, the chief medical officer of health. So I don't know, in Florida, you have a surgeon general, I think. Yeah, right? yeah. Same, uh -huh. same idea, chief, chief public health person. Uh, so Richard Chavis was for 10 years, the chief medical officer of health in Ontario, and had a distinguished record as such, and was quite prescient when we had the first SARS uh, epidemic, not well, never was quite an epidemic, but it was Richard who saw the disease wasn't infectious enough to be concerning. That would be, all that needed to be done was better infection control in hospitals. Bob's your uncle. He was right. He was shown to be right. So he. There are lots of reasons why people in Ontario should have been interested in his view. When he expressed mild criticism, particularly about the idea of lockdowns mm -hmm. on the CB, on the national network of the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation in March of 2020, he was immediately canceled. And I have the email trail, which I have the order. He, you must never, you must not have him on again. Having him on is equivalent to having a climate change denier. Um, who are you or who? Who is this? This is Richard Chavis. He has it, never appeared on the CBC again. Oh, so okay. I see. What what we had was a virtual revolution. And you don't even need to say virtual. A revolution in public health thinking was implemented overnight without public discussion. And if any of the old public health establishment, like Richard Chavis, and I could name 10 or 20 others, raised their hand and said, excuse me, we, you've misunderstood quarantine. It, you, you don't put the healthy people in quarantine. You put the sick people in quarantine. Yeah. They were just were canceled. And, yeah. and so we had, in effect, uh, a revolution 
mm -hmm. quite literally, in thinking. And then an order not to discuss it, right? A, a loyalty test was imposed if you wanted to discuss it. The Canadian Medical Association, um, the Ontario Medical Association, pardon me, has, will institute disciplinary proceedings against any doctor who questions vaccine, this vaccine, distancing, lockdown, doesn't matter. Any element of the orthodoxy that is questioned by any doctor, they will be subject to disciplinary, disciplinary proceedings by their own college. So there goes the doctor-patient relationship, right? Informed consent is out the window, which everybody said was the bedrock. It was the source of legitimacy of modern medical practice as declared at Nuremberg, 1947. This will never happen again. No person will ever again be subjected to a medical procedure without their consent. Well, and, and somehow this, this is not noticed, right? Yeah. This becomes the, and it becomes almost exclusively the issue of the libertarian right, mm -hmm. who can see it because they're, they have the right ideological spectacles. They're it's funny that, that it's funny they're that expecting, the, they're expecting governments to yeah. act like horses' asses. So they're not surprised. And it's funny also that the the traditional defenders of so-called capitalism are the biggest critiques uh, are doing the biggest criticism of uh, these giant corporations. You know, <laughs> you yes, know what I mean. And, and that that to me says, you know, couldn't we do a a, a political rethink here? Yeah, yeah. We redraw the boundaries, and and reconsider our political allegiances. That's, I mean, that's my. Uh, hope, yeah, uh, vain as it may be, it remains my hope that that will happen eventually, right? Um, because it's, I'm no, I'm no happier with the right than with the left, right? I, I mean, I, I greatly admire some of the things your governor has done, but I, I'm, I'm not necessarily going to be any happier with him as president than if he can make it. <laughs> <laughs> and if that's what he wants, yeah. uh, then Joe Biden, you know, yeah. he's, he's certainly uh, mentally more acute <laughs> than Joe Biden. But, you know, I, I'm, I'm law, I, I wish we could open the conversation and, and rethink a lot of these things. And if we could, then obviously the people we've been talking about, Elif Shikhar, become very, very important. Interestingly enough, you know, you've got, uh, J.D. Vance and Blake Masters. You know Blake Masters and J.D. Vance? I, I know who J.D. Vance is. He was, that was Hillbilly Elegy, and now he became a member of your Congress, I think. Well, right? no, he's he, he got the Republican nomination to be uh, U.S. Senator in Ohio. He hasn't won okay. the Senate race yet. But okay, he's, so he's, he's the, the nominee for, yeah, for the Republicans. Go before the voters in November. Yeah, and then Blake Masters, who uh, was Peter Thiel's uh, president of his foundation okay. uh, and wrote Zero to One, which is a mimetic theory explanation of startups and competition and business, basically. Oh. Uh, Blake Masters got the Trump endorsement for U.S. Senate in Arizona. Both of these individuals have read Rene Girard very much and have talked about Rene Girard so this could be the first time we have, at least that I'm aware of, you know, potentially people in the U.S. Senate who would have an understanding of some of these apocalyptic uh, yeah. <laughs> disclosures of the gospel in mind as they look at these big affairs that we're dealing with. So I don't know what that would do, if anything, to help, but it'd be interesting to see what happens with that. I asked Blake Masters uh, when I interviewed him recently, I said, what are you going to do with Rene Girard in the U.S. Senate? And he's like, I think he was taken aback by it, but I mean, that's everything I look at. I mean, when I look at these texts and I see this sentence, I, you know, uh, the stone, the builder rejected has become the cornerstone. I feel as if we are in a trap, <laughs> the gospels, it's like a stumbling block. And the more, and you, you fall on it. And the more you resist, the more it crushes you to pieces. 
until you are forced almost to choose, you know, to double down on evil and chaos and violence or repent and say, I've had enough of it. It's almost that the more you struggle against the call of the gospel, the more insane you become as a society, which is exactly what we're in today on the medical side and, and various other things. I mean, I, I look at that, this idea of, uh, I had a, one of the doctors on, and I can't even say these names without this video will be, you know, attacked on YouTube. So we have to use code words to get past the, the droid army of censors. <laughs> but, you know, I had one of the doctors on and he said uh, that that's treated, you know, this uh, pandemic a different way. And he was saying, it's amazing the people we find who have had injuries or uh, loved ones or children injured from these products that they're, that they talk oftentimes without anger or rage about these corporations, but almost like, well, it was for a good cause, you know, it was for the fight of, of, of public health and, 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 you know, science. And it was in the name of science, which, which kind of goes back to what Gerard says is that the gods, although they've been crushed in some sense, they have kind of, they've kind of camouflaged themselves into terms like public health. You don't yeah, worship yeah. Thor. We worship public health and that kind of transcendent feeling that we get that you're willing to say, I'm willing to have my child be injured in the name of showing how much I'm willing to self-sacrifice in obedience to this big other, this transcendent institution that, that has certain worldview uh, yeah, scientism, you know, and, and the idea of human beings being able to master nature, right? And being able to tinker with gain-of-function things and then provide gain-of-function products for us to take to fix ourselves from the gain-of-function experiment. It's, this is religion. <laughs> this is a, a, a kind of religion, you know? It's, it's not a kind of. It is religion. It's just hidden <laughs> a little bit. Yes. I don't, I don't think Ivan would have disagreed with that. I mean, he one of the things that he he left behind as an unfinished work was um, he, he was asked to talk about life in in the 1980s um, and he he took it on you know and in 1989 in front of a Lutheran uh, convocation in Chicago he, he gave a talk um about the worship of life which which he said was the greatest idol that the church has faced in its history so he was he was in earnest about this um and i think he regarded it finally as what we talked about earlier the corruption of of the best is the worst you know because obviously what Christ is life, according to Ivan's faith. Um, and so he he never got a hearing at all on that score. Uh, and and when I when I first read that talk, I was kind of amazed by it and I asked him if he would do an, a supplementary interview with me uh, for ideas about this idea of life as idol. And I, I thought I, I had a hold of a bombshell. <laughs> he said, no, that's, you're wrong. But, uh, but when I broadcast it, and this, for those who are interested, this forms the final, the transcript of that whole conversation from which I edited the program forms the last chapter of a book called Ivan Illich in Conversation. It's called The Cosmos in the Hands of Man. But the program went over like a lead balloon. Um, it was the only, I think, it was the only thing I ever broadcast that seemed to to, uh, in a way, in effect, the broadcast never occurred. It, it didn't, it was like I hadn't said any, it was like no one had said anything. It was amazing to me um, that this, and the only explanation I could give was that 
this had become what it was called a certainty, something so obvious that it really wasn't at all no noticeable, right? That mm -hmm. we've been saving life, saving planet Earth, saving life, saving lives, that the, the language is so deeply part of us and the contradiction between saving and managing is so, we're so adept at sliding between the two as if they were the same thing, right? So we're so steeped in personnel and human resources and all the various languages which, which make life a resource, right? And at the same time, these other languages that make life something sacred, right? So all that Anthony Fauci or anybody else has to say is that we're saving lives and that's, that's enough. Yeah. Um, so what Illich couldn't be understood about in his own time seems to me now that's something that's absolutely crucial to understand. And it's, it's, it's first and foremost a, a religious question, right? It, it is, if we're living in a transposition, not even to use a more colored word like corruption, just say we're living in a transposition of, of Christianity and we don't recognize it, right? Because we think we've abandoned Christianity, and a, a great deal of public talk is 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 directed against Christianity, right? All these heritage heritage heritages. <laughs> it's hard to say that we reject or denounce. Um, that then it's a it's a very mystifying situation to live in, right? Because you, you, in effect, you've driven your your religion underground. You've you've driven it into unconsciousness, where presumably it controls you. Because mm -hmm. uh, if it's unconscious, you're not controlling it, or or even controlling is too strong a word, but not even reflecting on it. So that seems to me. Uh, a plausible digest of Illich, de-schooling society, medical nemesis, all the rest, right? That these are, these are transpositions and they're finally cannot be understood without understanding their origin, right? They didn't just, they're not a product of rationality, right? Uh, it's amazing that we can think that, that that they were a product like who would, who would devise a school system as a way of imparting education yeah. or the medical system i mean the the height of absurdity for us here uh, you probably had the same was, was that the whole point of the covid policy was that we were going to save our healthcare system mm -hmm. so we're in a healthcare emergency which presumably is why we have a healthcare system to take care of us during an emergency. Only, but we're taking care of it, right? Yeah. We're protecting it. Yeah. I mean, why doesn't that set off an alarm bell? Right. Why don't you think this doesn't sound right? <laughs> this doesn't yeah. sound right. It's because presumably it's it's not conscious. Yeah. So it has to be made conscious in some way, and that seems to me finally a project of reformation, right? Yeah. Of, 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 that perhaps has to be premised on the idea that we are homo religiosus, that we yeah. are inherently religious beings, that we cannot help ourselves from carrying what Karl Barth called the yoke of religion, right? Right. And and therefore, we have to try and make what is our religion conscious. Yes, uh, that, that, as a, as that, a starting point, um, I do, I do believe that the longer we persist in being saturated in the gospel, but not repenting of our violence, the more it will make us go mad and crazy. I think that's kind of what it's like. 
I think it's it's like um I mean I, I look at I look at I saw these videos of uh that are everywhere, children being exposed to these uh pride parades where their kids are watching naked people parade in front of them and all kinds of, you know, garish kink costumes. And that's supposed to, their, their parents are taking their kids to see these things because they think this is what it means to be good in this society that we're in. And they take them to a drag bar and you see these little kids playing their little kids are five years old, six, seven, and six month old little babies too. And they're in these sexualized drag bars as these people dance around and garish, you know, things. and and sexualizing this stuff and making it and and I'm thinking to myself this is this is what Gerard talked about I mean he he talked about the time of the festival and the carnival right becoming this sacred time of undifferentiation and role reversals and everybody puts on a mask and you don't know if you're dancing with the mayor's wife or whatever you don't yeah. know what's going on and now that's become the norm that's become there's no it's not a sacred time that we all get to act crazy. Now we are saying, no, if you don't accept this as the way things ought to be all the time, you are going to be pushed out of society. We don't want you here. Yeah. Every day a carnival is where we're at, you know? Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, that's interesting. Even the United Methodist Church, they're dividing right now over this issue of, of these issues of differentiation and boundaries and what is marriage and what is this. And they have a drag queen pastor who's a who's a drag queen pastor, and 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 this guy says that he's he is bringing the the teachings of carnival to the church. And I'm thinking, well, the church kind of helped us get away from carnival for a reason, you know. I mean, there's something that happens at carnival. It's called sacrifice to conclude the matter. I mean, that's why we don't want to have carnival all the time because when you don't have a sense of self, you're gonna go towards sacrificial impulses to kind of reorient yourself, you know? Right. So I guess I want to land the plane there. Is any concluding thoughts about, um, I mean, I've, I've come to engage Gerard and I see it as sharpening my conclusion that the gospel really gives you an anarchistic kind of, uh, um, perspective on where things are going that, these strong structures of order are breaking down and they break down, not necess necessarily, but because we don't want to learn to get along with one another in that, that free space of love that, that you see with the good Samaritan, that voluntary choice to love our neighbor. We don't want the voluntary version of these things. We keep trying to come up with more and more excuses to sneak in the sacred violence that is more, appealing to us. And I think the more we continue to do that, the more we're going to have this maddening moment of undifferentiation. So we're in an apocalyptic moment because the things that we do because of globalism, they spread wildfire all over the globe. Mm -hmm. I mean, Gerard alluded to that in your last episode with him in CBC. He said, you know, globalism is going to be like you light a match and set fire to the whole world, you know, because of globalism. Well, I mean, I, I far be it from me to try and answer what you've just said. It's hardly a question, but but let me just say one thing. I mean, I, I'm um, the next project after this Illich book um, is is which I'm now well along with is is a reflection on public broadcasting. That's what I spent my life in, and. I don't know what kind of a book it is yet. Even it's it's a little bit of an autobiography. It's a little it's a it's a reflection on the history of the CBC, but it's also about how the, what public broadcasting could conceivably do in the current situation. Um, and I I think a certain amount of since you spoke of voluntary, a certain asceticism is is absolutely essential right so illich wrote about the the guard of the eyes right or the guard of the ears i mean these these were always part of how people lived right that you couldn't just promiscuously expose yourself 
to every kind of sight and sound and influence that it would be. And I mean, so we've reached this maximum with social media and cell phones and the rest where each one is a broadcaster. I mean, that's a long way to come in a short lifetime with yeah. mine where, yeah. you know, there were a handful of media outlets and now each one is a media outlet. So I don't think there's any, I mean, people say, well, how are you going to deal with that? Well, the only way you can deal with it is first to recognize it. You, it's not going to, it's not going to be easy to uninvent. And second, to stand back from it, right? To, if you can't hear yourself think, then you can't hear yourself think. There's no way around that. Yeah. The only way you can learn to hear yourself think is to find a quiet space. And so, you know, there will have to be some sort of asceticism and a whole variety of, I hesitate to use the expression, but neo-monastic cultures in the sense that the monasteries were an attempt to preserve something for the time being, right? right? A way of holding on to certain ideas, traditions, understandings, and to to bring them to bring them forward so that they will continue to exist. But yeah, there there can't be that we would have behaved as as people have behaved in the last two years, and that will have no consequences, right? Right. You can't overturn informed consent and say you were just kidding. Right. Yeah. You've overturned it. You've said, well, there's a higher, there's a higher good here than than that reflect that, you know, individual we can't afford individual choice anymore, right? Yeah. Well, there's plenty more as as all the big brains keep reminding us, there's plenty more pandemics where that came from. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Even if they even if they didn't make it in their laboratory, you know, I mean, everybody says that every time you hear Bill Gates or the equivalent person, the next. They're very pandemic, sure that we're going to have another one. Yeah, the next pandemic, right? And that's the that's the basis of their rule. I just wish that it wasn't always Malthusians tell us that we're going to have a new pandemic. I'm just tired yeah. of that. Can we get the information from somebody else besides them yeah. for once? You know, yeah. <laughs> so, don't trust their prescriptions, you know? <laughs> so. Well, David, I really appreciate your time, sir. And uh, I thank you for being able to, uh, you know, kind of go with me and riff with me on these different individuals that you have interacted with, with and, and tried to make uh, understandable for new generations. So. Um, I really thank you for your time. Thank you, David, and, and greetings to all your listeners. And I'm glad to have seen you. Very good. And check out your website, davidkaley.com, where you can find his new work, Ivan Illich, An Intellectual Journey, which is out now. Thank you. <laughs>